Welcome to the Art of Faith podcast. I'm Joshua Kapczynski. We have some set designs that we want to talk about today. So right behind me are three French candlesticks, different periods. Uh, the silver ones are 16th century French uh, polychrome. So they have been super fancy back in the day. And uh, right now, well, they're kind of falling apart, but they're still really cool. And they're 16th century, so 1500. Uh, America wasn't even a country at that time. And then the other one that is that is not all silvery and shiny looking, that one is a 13th century candlestick from France. And that's probably one of my favorite pieces. Now, everything's for sale. That one's going to be a hard sell because I like this piece, and uh, it means a lot to me. What's fascinating about the candlestick, the wooden one, the, the oldest one, it's the oldest thing in this set, by the way. The What I like about this candlestick is that, uh, well, there's a couple of things. One, it has it's full of holes, so it has like these little worm holes in it, wormwood. Um, but when they carved it, there was no worms in it. And so they just kind of, they were, well, the interesting thing about this piece is that it was born with worms in it. I like to use it as an illustration for uh, the the original sin. So we were born with original sin. So we're born a little tainted. We have some worms in us, and eventually they're going to pop up. So it has to be fumigated. And so you got to fumigate this thing. Maybe you need to fumigate yourself. So I love that about it. So it kind of it's a great illustration for original sin. Um, it's intricately carved and all on the outside. So the guy was too lazy to carve the whole thing. So he only carved the outside of it because it was going to be stuck in a corner somewhere. And then the other thing I like about it is it's got a burn mark. So somewhere, um, mo most likely, this piece came out of Orleans. Um, it, it came out where Joan of Arc would have went to church. Uh, that's that's where I bought it. And um, uh, so there was a fire there um, years and years ago. And so maybe this is a part of that fire. Who knows? But cool pieces. They're for sale. Um, inquire if you're interested in that. The other uh, studio changes that I want to bring to your attention, and it's going to be the, the topic for today's topic um, are these black and white photos that are on the walls. I've got three of them. I have another one somewhere else. I don't know where it's at. Uh, these are original photos from the the early 1900s. So 1918, uh, 1918, 1919, somewhere around there. So shortly after uh, World War I, these photos were taken in the area of Israel. And they're historically significant. I don't even know how much they're worth. Uh, they're probably worth more than I think that they are. Because uh, this is a very important and significant time in world history. Not just the history of, uh, of Israel, but of world history. And, and if you're a person of faith, if you're a, a Bible-believing person, you know how important the nation of Israel is and you know how that, that prophecy has been foretold. And so it's a really big deal um, that... Israel became a nation. So I, I hang with me. I'm going to do a little bit of a short history lesson. All of us are familiar with the Bible stories. It, most likely, if you're listening to this podcast, you're familiar with the Bible stories. And uh, maybe you can understand a little bit of the historical context of the, the, the drama, of the story, of the people of Israel and of Jesus and of Israel and Jerusalem. Um Somewhere along the lines, Israel just couldn't get their act together. And, uh, you know, they go through a series of being conquered and reestablishing the kingdom and being conquered again. It's like a it's a cycle, right? The, we call it the cycle of sin. And at one point in time, uh, the final death knell to, the, to Israel as a nation, as a country, as an independent uh, force, a sovereign force, uh, the death knell, ironically, was given by the Europeans. So Alexander the Great in 300 came in and established a European presence in Israel. 
uh, and then then shortly followed by the Romans. There was a uh, one little uh, revolution there for a moment with the Maccabeans and the uh, the whether the Cutbar revolt or something like that. So it, there was uh, there was a little bit of a flare up, but then the Europeans, the Greeks, and the Italians just grinded the Jews back into the ground. And then the destruction of the temple in 70, 69, 70 AD was, that was it. So they burned the temple to the ground and then the Jews were systematically dispersed out of Israel. And so from that point on, uh, there was no nation or country uh, of Israel. There was no king, there was no governor, there was, you know, no no princes left anymore. It was all over. And the, the great diaspora, the dispersing of the Jewish people throughout Europe and Asia and, and Arabia, that's that's when that happened. So they just the Jewish people get scattered all over the world. And you know that was shortly after uh, Jesus' death and after the after the birth of Christianity. Fast forward, um, you know, a good almost 2,000 years. Uh, fast forward to um, 18, uh, 1850, no, 1880s, late 1880s, 1890s. Uh, there was in Europe, there was a very new and strong uh, Jewish movement called the Zionist movement. And um, you know, after the Jews have been dispersed specifically in, the, in, in Europe and in, in Russia and Germany, uh, they established communities, they established uh, power, they established finance, they established uh, commerce, trade, and uh, they were a, a, a strong people group. Um, and out of that, formed what they called the Zionist movement. And the the number one push for the Zionist movement is that they wanted a nation of their own. Uh, they were tired of being kind of subjugated as second class citizens in all these different countries that they that they were camping out at. I don't mean like literally camping out, but how you know the kind of force to be moved in. There was lots of persecution. They called it the pogroms that was taking place in in Russia specifically, and of course Germany. And so there was high levels of persecution, and a few people had the foresight to think that there's a chance that they could they could start their own nation. They could they could build something that ne- that hadn't existed uh, since. The, the diaspora since the times of Jesus or, you know, during that, that, that first century. Um, and Herzog uh, was the main character that decided that, uh, that we need to go for Israel. And so uh, he was dreaming about Israel. And then in the late, late, late 1800s, um, and then uh, he, he actually visited Israel from Switzerland and I visited Israel, I visited Egypt, and like the vision was there, the dream was there. And he has this famous quote saying, uh, if we can dream it, it will happen. So it's kind of like, you know, if you, if you, <laughs> what's the field of dreams quote? Um, if you build it, they'll come or something like that. But he believed that. He believed that if we can dream this thing, we can actually dream it into ex- existence. And so he's like one of the first manifestors. Um, you know, he's one of the first people to say, look, we can, we can make this thing happen. And at the time, it seemed completely impossible. Um, it just seemed like it just wasn't going to take place. To make things even more complicated, uh, Herzog was... Um, he was just a, a regular guy. He was a merchant. He was a, a politician of some sort, a uh, community leader, if you will. And what the irony is, is that the rabbis and the synagogues didn't want to. They did not want to return back to Israel. They actually believed that uh, the, the diaspora, you know, them being scattered out of the promised land was God's punishment. And that they had to live inside of God's punishment 
Uh, and so this is what they just had to accept. And the only thing that could deliver them from the punishment that the Jewish people deserved was the Messiah. And, um, well, they're still holding out for the Messiah, but you and I both know that the Messiah has come. So um, Herzog, in a way, made a, made a path, made a plan, uh, kind of gave the rabbis the middle finger and developed this idea that he stole from America, the separation of, of church and state, and basically said, you rabbis can stay inside of your synagogues and do religious things, but as Jewish people, we're going we're gonna to get a country of our own. There, was a, there were other uh, candidates besides Israel, by the way. They were thinking about setting up a new country in South America. Uh, I think one was in Argentina. I forgot where the other one was. But like they were coming up with some ideas of establishing their own country. Now, the reason why they didn't move to South America, and I, I'm, not, I'm not sure where the other location was, but I think there are two locations in South America that they were seriously considering. The reason why they didn't um, go for those locations was that there was a Jewish community in Israel at the time in Jerusalem? Now, this Jewish community, they just kind of they were they just never left. You know, these were the ones that didn't get dispersed, and that was a small remnant. It was a um, a minority group, and they just kind of were able to do the Jewish thing, and they'd go to the Wailing Wall. They've been doing it for hundreds of years, and so there was an established Jewish community. And so one of the pushes was like, okay, we can't leave these people behind. We can't say, hey, we're going to start a country over here when like their heart was, they were already in their own country. In Ukraine, ironically, I know we've got lots of problems in Ukraine right now. Uh, in Ukraine, there was a group of Jewish people. This is in the late 1800s uh, and then the early 1900s that they were being persecuted by the Ukrainian people. The Jews were being persecuted by the Ukrainian people. Again, they call it a pogrom. And they just got sick and tired of it. They got fed up. And they just packed up their bags and moved into Israel. This is the very first time that a that, that people were migrating into Israel, and it was a big giant group of them. They even bought they bought their own land and they began to farm it. They began to work the the property uh, it just immediately, and even independent of the Zionist movement. But that gave everybody a little bit of hope, like this can be done. And then they had the audacity to even call it their land, even though they didn't own it. Now, uh, World War II uh, happens, and it is the war to win, the, to end all wars. It's a freaking bloodbath. It's just, it's just horrible. Um, at the time, one of the major powers was the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Empire was everywhere from... Um, all of Israel, what we call Israel, they call it the Levant, or they call it Palestine. Some people still call it Palestine, of course. All of that whole area, um, Jordan, all the way down to Egypt, I maybe even, if I forget, but maybe even parts of Egypt, uh, was all considered um, the Ottoman Empire, what we call modern-day Turkey, Greece. Uh, the Ottoman Empire stretched all the way up to the Austrian border, so they were pushing uh, their influence all the way into Europe at the time. The Ottoman Empire was ginormous, and they were ruling for hundreds of years. But World War I was the death knell for the Ottoman Empire. And they were on their way down anyway, but that just that war just crushed them. And when the Ottoman Empire just fragmented, um, the Allied forces came in and began to divvy up the land. They began to draw lines on maps. And um, and from there, they began to draw lines on maps that would eventually make room for these Zionists to come in and have a nation of their own and have land of their own. And uh, it was the Jewish people that, that uh, excuse me, it was the British Empire. It was the, the Brits that, that basically gave them a lease on the land. They just, they just kind of said, come on in. You know, they brought in some peace. They brought in some order. They organized the stuff after that, after that big major war. And then they, in essence, just kind of abdicated it or handed it over to the Jewish people. And they started, they started coming in in mass. So that's what these photos are. So these photos are the story of that very moment. Um, 
the this one over here to my left actually see a british officer with his pith helmet and so right again right after the ottoman empires you know right after the war after the ottoman empires crumbled you know they're walking through the ruins of of what was uh once jerusalem and uh they're getting ready to hand it over to um the jewish people and then of course this one right here behind me is the streets of jerusalem and uh there is some some uh rabbi or orthodox jew in there so um that's that's the short story so what i like about these works is that um some sometimes people don't consider photography art but it is a huge art form so these are like incredible pieces because one they're photos of the period of the time they're not copies uh they're not you know digital images like like the film is that old and um, like that's really that's really cool in my opinion obviously I think that that's really cool and it's cool that I I don't know who this artist is or who this photographer is um, but it is a tradition a new tradition like these these people these photographers these early photographers it was a pioneering of not only um, journalism and recording uh historical facts which we they didn't ha we didn't have prior to the camera and towards or towards um cinema um but they were able to capture uh historical moments and again this is one of the you know uh the camera came around in the mid 1800s and so this is fairly new this is a new art form that just that begins to change the world and so these are obviously very exciting pieces, um, but it's going to lead me to my my next idea or my next photo that I that I want to share. And this photo coming up on the screen is uh, Maxim Duchamp, and he is a French photographer. And around the same time, the nation of Israel is about to be born. So this is early, late 18, 1800s. Um, this French, um, photographer, uh, went on tour. So, um, the Europeans before the, before the first great war, the Europeans had some money. They, there was, they call it the nouveau riche, the new rich, uh, the bourgeoisie. So these, um, the, the the expanding of the middle class so it was it was an exciting time in in Western Europe to have that level of freedom to um, you know not necessarily depose you know the aristocracy but there was lots of lots of opportunity to grow right out of the Industrial Revolution and so there's a lot of new rich people <clears throat> and these new rich people began to travel. So just think about, um, you know, even though this is a little bit later, but it's the same type of feel and the same type of culture. Just think about Agatha Christie and uh, what is it? Death on the Nile. So think about that movie. And that's kind of the same idea. It is, they called it um, the Grand Tour. And so these Europeans wanted to go on a Grand Tour. And so they began to take uh, tours of the East. So they loved Egypt. They loved Israel. They loved to, They wanted to go and see those places. Uh, they would venture off into India because of the British empire had, you know, holdings in, in India. Uh, they loved Arabia. They loved anything that, uh, call it the romantic movement anything that that harkened back to a romantic age of the noble savage and so they loved the the painting they love they, they have to do paintings of you know arab warriors on their camels with their you know with their exotic rifles and such so it was you know it was a, a very romanticized period and so they love to go on these grand tours and um one of the places that they went to, uh, obviously, was Egypt. Egypt, at this time, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, 
Egypt was like, it's a trash pit. I mean, it was just, there was, there was not a whole lot going on. Um, I mean, there was the caliphates, um, you know, some bickering between the Ottoman empire and there was all kinds of problems. It was not a stable place and nor did the Muslims appreciate the art of the Egyptians. Um, when you look at the pyramids today, they look obviously made out of stone and they look very rough. You know, so if you get close to them, you know, you can see all the different like steps and all the edges of the massive, massive rocks that were used to construct these things. And it's just mind boggling how they did it. Um, but prior to what we see, um, and prior to the Muslim empires, uh, they were encased in white marble. So, you know, if Jesus would have headed down to, well, he did head down as a kid. Uh, if Jesus or if anybody in the first two centuries, uh, actually all the way first five centuries, if you would have headed down to, to, to Egypt, you would have seen these, you would have seen the pyramids closer to what they originally were. They would have been white. They would have been super smooth, uh, covered in white limestone. I mean, just, they would just blow you away when you saw these white things. Now, um, the Muslims, they, they, t they stripped all that white marble and white limestone off of the pyramids so they could build their mosques and stuff. So when you look at a mosque, you're actually looking at and the mosque, excuse me. When you look at a mosque in, in Egypt, uh, you're also looking at pieces of the pyramids. So and it's unfortunate, but that's just, that's just what history does. And so they just didn't, the Muslims just didn't appreciate Egyptian culture. Um, I mean, I'm going to bash on the Egyptians in my sermon on Sunday. Um, but regardless, I, I think like what they did was really, really cool. Um, the pyramids, the great pyramid of Giza, I it's, it's ginormous. Um, like these blocks make no sense and we can't even figure out how to reconstruct it to this day. Uh, with modern technology, we can't we can't reproduce uh, what they did. We don't know how they did it. We don't know how they moved them. Uh, you know, the Egyptologists and the archaeologists, and the old school guys, uh, will say, "Well, they just use leverage." Uh, it's just it doesn't. They still can't figure it out. And um, and to have you know the Great Pyramid aligned to true north, like almost perfectly, it's just mind boggling. So. In and of themselves, the the Egyptian people are the ancient Egyptians and what they're able to make and the vastness of their structures and of their statues, it's just hard to wrap your head around. And so after years of neglect, these things began to just disappear, like literally under the sand. Uh, and so when these Romantic Europeans start showing up in, in the mid 1800s and into the 1900, early 1900s. Uh, they're just like fascinated with what is literally under the stand under the sand. When they show up in Cairo in 1850 ish, um, the Sphinx is buried up to his neck in sand. They don't even know what's underneath it. Uh, the pyramids are are buried um, to a certain degree. Like they don't even know where half the tombs are. And then, you know, of course, this is the time when they find, you know, King Tut's tomb. They got lucky. They lucked out and they they found this treasure trove because a lot of these things were robbed in the ancient in the ancient times and you know everything was looted by grave robbers. And so the early I'm not the early, but you know, these these Europeans on these grand tours, they started to take a huge interest in the ancient world and preserving. And so they start funding stuff. They start digging stuff out. Like they start documenting and well, so that's obviously a huge plus 
Because if they hadn't have found interest and they hadn't seen value in these ancient works of art, like, you know, I'm not saying that they'd still be buried right now, but they would still, that they, they, we probably would have lost a lot of them. Now, the other side of the coin is a lot of stuff ends up in the British Museum and in the Louvre and, you know, in museums in Germany. Like, there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of looting going on. Um, it, same thing happens in Greece. So in Greece, uh, again, after World War I, uh, the, the Parthenon, which is the most incredible temple uh, in the world, was covered in marble reliefs called the Elgin marbles. Elgin's the guy that took them off. So we don't know what they were called before that. But incredible marble reliefs of the Iliad and the Odyssey just depicting Greek gods. I mean, and just like amazing. And so, you know, when these Europeans showed up, when the Brits showed up, they're like, that's really cool. And it's fallen apart. And so they just took them down. They, 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 they took them down to preserve them, but they also took them back to Britain. And so in the art world, in the ancient art world, um, there, that was the very first um, controversy about who owns what. And it's, it's the Elgin marble controversy. So, um, you know, when Greece begins to um, pull itself out of, you know, uh, poverty and begins to become a, a stronger nation and begins to be a player in, you know, the world economy. They're like, hey, you, you have our stuff. We, hey, Britain, uh, we, we would like our marbles back. And so Britain just says, yeah, no, uh, if it wasn't for us, they, they wouldn't exist. So now that is a that is a that's a, obviously a big problem. So same situation happens in France. Same situation happens in Britain. And so it's a debate. Um, I don't even know if there is an answer to to this because um, world heritage is a big deal. Like we have works of art that like they're just vital to our story as as humans and so they need they need to be preserved uh we shouldn't allow uh nature or humans to destroy uh heritage sites so um i think probably in the long run maybe we do need to return works of art back to their original country i think that's probably a good idea so I know that Egypt wants some of their 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 pieces back, and I I, I could understand Egypt is in a, a lot better spot than it once was, and you know I think that they deserve to have some of their items back. So I, again, we'll let the countries and the lawyers and the museum directors fight that out. And I'm, I'm not quite sure what the right answer is. Um, but I do know that there has to be an honest and mindful, um, honest and mindful conversations about how do we preserve, uh, heritage works of art. So a great example would be when, um, when Iraq fell to ISIS, so during after the Iraqi war, we all know the story. We all saw it on the TV, uh, created a power vacuum. And there's the museum in Baghdad, which houses some of the oldest and most important works of art in human history. Uh, when, when, when they, when they came out, uh, when there was a, when there was a power vacuum, ISIS, a uh, Muslim extremist, I know this podcast sounds like I'm hating on Muslims right now, but I'm not. It's just the extremists that, that we don't like. Uh, but ISIS came in and they just they brought sledgehammers into the museums and they just started just smashing and destroying everything. And it's like we should have saw that coming. 
Like we should have hauled that stuff out of there. There's always a good curator that knows like when the bad guys are coming, you take your works of art and you hide them or you ship them off somewhere to keep them safe, no matter what the cost. Um, ISIS also destroyed uh, 20 foot Buddhas in, um, in Afghanistan, like just absolutely incredible mind boggling works of art. And, they did. They didn't like them. The ISIS didn't like them because they were idols or whatever. And so they just took dynamite and they blew them up in our own lifetime. And so the, that's just not okay. So, um, okay. So back to, uh, back to, um, the French uh, people on tour. Uh, Maxim Ducamp is the one that takes this next photo of of an Egyptian temple. And this is out in the middle of the desert. And like when they, when the Europeans showed up, this temple complex is literally buried in sand. Like there's just a few little pieces poking up here and there. And so they just begin to start excavating and they begin to uncover, um, this monumental Colossus statue of Ramses. Uh, Ramsey the second. So what's fascinating about this one is that Ramses the second is considered the greatest pharaoh of all time. He is for sure by far the most powerful New Kingdom pharaoh, and the New Kingdom is the most influential kingdom. So most most scholars believe that. Ramses is the most influential and the most powerful pharaoh the world had ever seen or Egypt has ever seen. And he expanded, he built, he's called Ramses the Great. He's considered to be a god. Um, and then if you look at this statue of Ramses, and there's another very large, uh, I think it's like a 20-foot colossal of him too in other places. Like he's just, it's mind-boggling. And so what's fascinating is that when the Europeans showed up, like everybody forgot who this guy was. He's completely, literally buried under the sand. And then they just begin to, to uncover. They begin to apply some scholarly work. They're interpreting hieroglyphs. And they just kind of figure out, they figure out who he is. And, um, but yeah, he was largely, largely forgotten. What I'm going to highlight in my, in my sermon is that the most powerful man at that time, Ramses II, the most powerful man that the world had ever seen, um, he is largely forgotten by most of us. Uh, I don't know. If I was to ask you who is the pharaoh of, of the Exodus, uh, I mean, unless you just watch that Disney show, uh, The Prince of Egypt, or you're a Charlton Heston fan, you might not know. I mean. The Pharaoh of the Exodus is not Yul Brenner. Yul Brenner is the actor that plays Ramses II. And so a lot of people don't know who Ramses II is. And of course, you know, we're all familiar with, you know, e Egyptian stuff, but we're like, like, who's that guy? What did he do? Um, you know, why is, you know, no one really can, can name his accomplishments, but his contemporary, Everybody knows who Moses is. Everybody knows what Moses did. Nobody knows what Ramses did. But everybody knows who, what Moses did. Moses brought down plagues upon Egypt. Moses set God's people free. Moses split the Red Sea and everybody walked across into freedom on dry land. Moses provided for the people in the desert for 40 years. Moses led the people all the way up to the border of the promised land, ushering in a new generation into the promised land. Like, everybody knows what Moses did. Nobody knows what Ramses did. And what's fascinating is that Ramses is the guy that's got the statue. And Moses... Moses is just written about. It's not until the Enlightenment that we begin to make statues of Moses. Um, 
So I know I was kind of like all over the place on this one, but a couple of things that I think that I just want to encourage you to think about. Um, one is that God's ways are not our ways. Moses didn't want to do um, what he was called to do initially. He didn't. He didn't see God's God's path in all of this. Uh, when he first started out, um, there was when he first started out in his calling. When Moses first started in his ministry, uh, it was plagued by failure. He. He did not do well. Uh, people did not accept him as the leader out of the gate. Uh, people accused him of making their lives worse. And it it was he like his calling, him being obedient in his calling, actually made at the, at the beginning made things harder for the people. So when he's like, "Hey, uh, Pharaoh, hey Ramses the uh, second, I want to take." I want to take the Israelites out into the desert so that we can worship God. So when, when Moses confronts Pharaoh with this ask, say, hey, I, I need to take our people out so that we can worship God in the desert. Um, and Pharaoh says no. He makes things harder for the Israelites. Pharaoh does. He takes away their straw. He still demands that they meet their quotas. And there, you know, there's lots of persecution and lots of whipping. And I mean, it's just, it's like, wait a minute. I, we signed up for this. We signed up for things to go wrong and things to be bad and for things to go from bad to worse. And they couldn't see the forest through the trees. They couldn't see that this was God's path in order to get them to the point of freedom meaning that God's ways are not our ways. Sometimes we have to go through hard things. Sometimes when we sign up to become Christians, we think that everything's just going to go okay and all of our prayers will be answered and things won't be hard. Um, God's ways are not our ways. God has got a, he's got a path, and a lot of times it doesn't make sense, but he's got a path to get us to where ultimately we need to be. We might not like the path, but there is a path. I'll, I'll tie it into the whole art thing. Like, you know, these pieces of art, like, you know, is Jerusalem, um, the, the city itself as a, as a piece of art needed to be preserved. The Elgin marbles needed to be preserved. Um, the, the great Sphinx needed to be preserved. Uh, the pyramids needed to be preserved. All of these things needed to be preserved. We don't necessarily like the way that it happened. Because from my little story, how did it happen? It happened by a bunch of rich Europeans going on a tour, going on the grand tour, uh, being fascinated with romantic ideas. Uh, if it wasn't for their, well, and, and uh, the buzzword is the it wasn't for their Western expansion, if it wasn't for their imperialistic tendencies, there's a lot of works of art that we wouldn't have today. So I don't know if that parallel works. It probably is full of holes, but let's just say that God's ways are not our ways. And, you know, God wants to preserve you. He wants to preserve the things that are in you. And, you know, he might just bring some people into your life that will, that you might not agree with, but will challenge you and that will do whatever it takes to help you preserve something. So I'll leave there. I want you to, I want to encourage you just to be open-minded to, um, you know, the path is probably not what you might think that it would be, but in the big picture, God wants to, he wants to save his masterpieces. So with that, thank you so much for watching The Art of Faith and listening to The Art of Faith. We'll see you next time. God bless.